everybody and welcome to NCCB's YouTube channel. My name is Brett, this is my wife Claire and it's so good to have you with us. This is a great space to subscribe, follow and share. So trust that you enjoy the meeting. Good morning church. It really is good to be once again in a place where we could worship together. And I'm quite sure that you're all cuddled up with your blankets and your warm goodies because uh, it's been cold of late with snow last weekend. And of course, uh, this weekend, the temperature certainly has dropped, but really wonderful for us to be back in church and to celebrate dads and granddads on this day. And so it's Father's Day. I mean, I love being a dad. I love being a granddad. Um, and uh, we serve a God in heaven who describes himself as heavenly father, as a father who is very generous. And today we want to hear his perspective around the subject for this morning, which is really the subject of generosity. And so um, it's a subject that I did feel to preach on Father's Day because I wanted to stay within the context of our foundation series. And uh, the foundation series for me has been particularly helpful for me. You know, sometimes when you preach something, you learn things and you think to yourself, well, I can't really say this if I'm not actually doing it. Or, you know, on a scale of one to 10, where am I in this whole kind of growth curve of being mature uh, as a believer? And so this morning, I do want to just draw our attention back to the foundation series. And hey, dads, congrats. Uh, let's really um, enjoy our families today. Um, you know, my thoughts have always been that there are broken families. And uh, yeah, I felt just before I came onto the set that actually there's some of you that are looking to give up your fathering by simply pursuing another relationship. And I want to say to you this morning, don't do that. Uh, uh, I would say just stop right now in your tracks and maybe my words to you right now, your heart's skipping a big beat because I'm talking directly to you. Don't do that. As a father, our children look to us to be an example. And uh, you know what? I know what it's like being a dad. Um, hey, listen, sometimes... Clearly, things do seem to get to a place of difficulty, but that's not a reason for us just to abandon our fatherhood or our fathering. And so I'm going to urge you, I'm going to encourage you, hey, listen, let's stick to it. Let's make sure we've got good marriages in the church. When the world is in a mess, clearly as it is right now, you know, the coronavirus dynamic hasn't assisted at all. In fact, it's just put a great oppression across the globe. Uh, even more recent, the events concerning just racial abuse and the injustice that came with that. You know, I have to say, folks, we need dads to rise up. We need fathers just to stand their ground. We need fathers who are able to conduct life as it should be in our homes. All of those under our influence, we need to be able to say to them, hey, listen, what's the narrative of my home here? We don't tolerate racism. We don't tolerate injustice. And it's up to us as dads to be able to communicate that and to create a place of safety, a place of calmness with our kids. And, and I, you know what? If we hear them step out of line, well, that's up to us, dad. We can simply say, hold on. That's not the thinking. That's not going to help. That's not going to help the world that you're going to live in. And so the world that our kids are going to live in are very different to the world that we're living in. Well, it has to be. And so, of course, that's why we're here. We look at scriptures because this is the book, the Bible. This is what we're patterning our lives on. And so it doesn't matter who walks through the door of my office. I always reference the scriptures. I always reference this book because this is where we're going to find wisdom as dads and as granddads. So God bless you all. I just want to give a shout out to our media team. I want to tell you, these guys have been at the rock face. They've been doing particularly well. The auditorium, by the way, in the mornings is freezing cold in winter. And these guys are here all wrapped up in their winter willies, but my goodness, are they working hard. And also our musos, really, let's give a good shout out to our musos. I think they've done an outstanding job and uh, well done to all of them. And so this morning, let's pray. Can we do that? Father, what a day to celebrate our Heavenly Father. But not only that, what a day, what a day to recognize just dads, fathers, grandfathers, Thank you, Father, for that as a gift into the family. We pray, Lord God, that as I open up your scriptures and as I open up your word, that, Father, it's done with tenderness and something of your Father's heart is reflected through my preaching this morning, that we would see what your word says and just how, as a father, you would guide us in a time such as this. And so we surrender ourselves to your word, Father. We don't just want to be Christians who carry a Bible. We want to say, no, no, the Bible tells us what to do, and we're going to embrace and do what the word says. Thank you for your generosity to us. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, there are two, two accounts in the Gospels, one in Mark chapter 12 and one in Luke chapter 21, where we have Jesus standing next to the 
temple treasury. In other words, that's where the people placed their offerings uh, when they came to the temple. I mean, what a place to take up your position in church, right there at the offering moment. And he was watching just how the people were putting offerings into the temple treasury. And obviously the offerings would go towards that which the temple stood for. And uh, even today when we take up tithes and offerings, it's exactly the same thing. It's into the ministry that you and I are part of, where we feel that we're a son or we feel that we're a daughter or we feel this is our storehouse. Then that's what we do. We give towards that as a particular concern and we applaud the move of God that happens through the congregation that you and I are part of. And so that's what was happening at the moment. And so, you know, not only did Jesus notice this, but Jesus actually makes this comment about what the woman, you know, about her contribution. He says, this woman who's just put in two coins and they were considered to be the lowest denomination of the Jewish currency at the time or the then known world's currency at the time. It really, in today's kind of language, in today's if I was to try and draw a comparison between what it was that she put into the offering plate and, and to bring it into today's South African rands and cents, it's very difficult simply because we've got 2,000 years and so much has happened and in a sense value has changed much in terms of items, etc. But it works out at about 0.1%. In other words, it's less than a cent. South African cent, less than a cent. That's what you would earn per hour and I suppose if you put it into a 40 hour week, you're almost getting as much as 20 cents. You know? So really the value was very minimal. And Jesus is simply not drawing attention so much to the fact that she only put in two, two mites. That's the text that's used. He's actually saying it was a display of what was in her heart that she actually gave everything she had to give. That in a sense describes how generous the offering was. And so I just took down some comments from Charles Spurgeon, and he says this. He says, our gifts are not to be measured by the amount we contribute. And so that's not what Jesus was doing. His assessment of the moment was not so much in how much she was giving. It was more what was in her heart. And uh, Spurgeon says this, but by the surplus gift it kept in our own hand. Now, let me say that again. Okay, our giving is measured by the surplus kept in our own hand. Okay, so the two mites that the widow gave, actually there was nothing left in her hand. That's why he was drawing attention to the fact that her generosity was something to be an example. So of course they go outside and the disciples say to him, Jesus, this temple, I mean, look at it, it's really beautiful. And he says, don't be impressed by the shiny stones. All of this, all of this, gentlemen, because I know what you're thinking, disciples. You're thinking that it didn't take just two mites to build the temple that we've just come out of. And I know that that's what your implication is. That's why you're asking me about, wow, this temple's so great. He's simply saying, you know what? This thing's going to come down. And it actually did in AD 70. It did come down completely. And so I think when we look at that particular text, it's not so much that money was wasted in the treasury. It's just that that happens in the world that we're living in, is that actually you can give into a cause and in the moment you feel God tells you to do that and you need to follow that moment and in line with what it is. And so we want financial accuracy. Well, then you've got to line up with what the Bible describes as being biblical. And when you line up with what's spiritual, then you'll find that your financial targets are always met. And so I love that particular text because it does help me in the time that we're in at the moment, where folks are losing jobs, folks are taking pay cuts, things are a little difficult. And what you're having is people phoning in and saying, we need a payment holiday on our bond. We need a payment holiday on our motor car. We need, and and there's, it's just this, this kind of angst, this anxiety that is currently around us. And so we need to look at what the Bible says about those moments. Because this is not the first time that it's happened. And so previously, how have believers behaved in a time such as this. What is it that we should be doing? I mean, God would be very unfair to us if he didn't tell us, hey, listen, guys, I know you're in a mix, in a bit of a fix. And so what we're going to do is we're going to fix the fix that you're in. All right. And so what he does is he actually gives to us these incredible accounts, these incredible stories. And he says, it's about you being on the receiving end of my generosity even in a time such as the one that you're in. And sometimes that's very hard for us to actually recognize. But it's interesting as I look at Jesus, one of the biggest indicators to me of my spiritual maturity is how often Jesus makes reference to money, how often he makes reference to a generous heart. 
And how often we look at that and we can say, well, all right, if I have a generous heart according to how Jesus puts it, and if I'm able to see myself lining up with how it is that he suggests that I should behave, it then equals an, a level of maturity that I'm going to. So, you know, you kind of look at that and just as a logical conclusion, I've sat with Nadine and I've said to her, you know what, I think that what's in our current account is a reflection. And when I say what's in the current account, let's not talk about the amount. Let's talk about the line items in terms of what are we spending our money on. I said that actually reflects our maturity as believers. I don't know about you, but we had a good look at that. And we've also had a look at it. Sometimes you just think leaders, you know, we're up there. You know, we kind of got the hotline to heaven. And I get people who phone me and say, hey, Ash, you got the hotline to God. Can you pray for me in this? You know, it's not like that. We're also just in a situation where we've also got a lockdown. So what are we doing? Let's have a look at our budget. Let's see what shouldn't be there. And that's the advantageous thing about being in lockdown at the moment is that we can assess these situations and we can be vulnerable and we can say, oh God, look at this. We don't need it anymore. Um, and so that's what I'm suggesting here. So for me, it's almost as if I look at this and I think, okay, for my own maturity in the area of giving, you know, it's one thing to preach faith. It's another thing to walk what you talk. And I, you know, I'm, I'm the preacher. And so you kind of think to yourself, gee, you preach faith, you preach about the mountains, you preach about speak to the mountain and tell the mountain about your God. But now you're in a situation where, hold on, let's have a look and see how much you are trusting God at this time. And so I'm equally challenged, and that's why we've had to go, and we've had to look at this, and I've just felt, you know what, God, Jesus spoke so much about this subject, so let me have a look and look at those line items about what on earth are we spending money on. And so... I wanted to just draw attention to that. I think there is a, a disease that has crept into the church. And it's not just the disease that's crept in recently. It came in as early as Acts chapter 5, where you had Ananias and Sapphira. And they sold a piece of property. And uh, there was a culture at the time in the church. And it simply suggested that people were in such need and there was uh, just this generosity spirit that came upon the church and people were selling property and bringing the proceeds and contributing it into the life of the church so that the church could be a storehouse and they could help and just minister to the needs of the people. That's a wonderful, wonderful moment in Scripture. And also we've seen ourselves in a similar situation right now. Okay, so I look at this text and it says, they came in and both of them, had decided amongst themselves that they weren't going to give the entire amount that effectively they had made a promise that they would do it. And so what actually happens is they come in and they say, okay, independent of each other, Ananias comes in first and he decides, okay, this is the amount of money that I'm going to give. And Peter challenges and says, hey, hold on a minute. Uh, are you keeping anything back? And he says, yes. So then Peter says this to him. He says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit and you've secretly kept back part of the piece of the field. In other words, part of the proceeds. And instantly, I mean, how's this for New Testament grace? The man is struck down dead. Okay. Um, then his wife comes in. Peter asks the same question. All right. So, and, and she obviously colluded with him, with her husband. And uh, Peter says these words, he says, well, the feet that carried your husband out, they're waiting at the door and they're going to carry you out. And she gets killed as well. I mean, that's quite scary. And I mean, I look at that and I think, gee, all right, shall I preach this and you know, put the fear of God into the people's hearts? And I think, no, it isn't about that. It was just that in a culture of need, when the church was being generous, there were some people that locked their hearts to that. And we always have vulnerable with us. We always have people in need and we always have people who give. And the interesting thing is, is that you may find yourself on either side of that scale. You may be someone who gives at the moment. You may be someone who's in need at the moment. But there does come a time where you're able to give and you might well be in need. So we understand that that's life. All right. So anyway, let me, let me carry on here because I think what can happen in the church and what did happen then is that you had this condition. It's called cirrhosis of the giver. All right, I'm not trying to make fun of it. I'm just simply saying, because it's something that we don't feel. There's no cirrhosis of the giver when I want to re-sign my membership up at the Bryanston Country Club. There's no cirrhosis of the giver when I'm wanting to do some Christmas shopping. You know, I really find myself feeling particularly healthy and well. 
Uh, there's no cirrhosis of the giver when I step into a clothing store like diesel and I want to buy myself a pair of shoes or something like that. There's no cirrhosis of the giver there. There's no cirrhosis of the giver when it comes to buying a car or buying a house or something like that. You know, it's not like any, those things are wrong, but it's just that when it comes to this subject, when it comes to generosity, when it comes to giving, suddenly we don't feel too well. It's a truth that's inconvenient. And you know, inconvenient truths, they don't make, feel great, don't make us feel great. And so I'm looking at this text and I'm just thinking, God, you know what? Actually, I go to Paul now and I look at what Paul says. Paul says this, he says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. All my needs. So he's not prepared to supply my lifestyle. Well, that's a little different. He's saying, I'll provide for your needs. And when you look at the church of Philippi, it's a church that actually stood with Paul throughout his ministry travels. He even writes that he says, you know what, hey, um, no one stood with me, but you guys stood with me. So there is credit given to them because they saw the need of a man who was extending the kingdom and they did their best to support him and to stay in touch with his needs. All right. And so if I continue to look at this, then I realize that Paul is writing into a context and he is simply saying, you know what, sure. I can step in on your behalf, but there is a part that you play. And that's what I wanted to talk about this morning, is just to remind us about the part that we play. And so he then comes into, the, into Corinth. Now Corinth for me would probably be very much like a Joburg setting, kind of a center of economic influence. Most are within a 200 kilometer radius of where I'm standing right now. 70% of this country's economy is generated from. And so, you know what? People come to us because we're not called Igoli, city of gold for nothing. It's because all the jobs are here. And of course, when the coronavirus hits and we're in lockdown, your, your big empires, your big cities are going to be seriously affected. And so we're one of those and we fit that description very well. But when I look at Corinth, Corinth, the church in Corinth, was a church that was very vibrant, very colorful, and you have all the instruction given about ministry in the spirit. You have all the instruction given just about behavior and morality in the church. And I would say that actually we would tick that box very well. Here in Bryanston, the northern suburbs of Johannesburg, I would say absolutely. We are very much probably able to say, yeah, we can reflect some of the issues that the church of Corinth had. But in writing to them, he writes two letters. And the second letter he writes to them and he talks specifically about the Macedonian churches. And he says what he finds, and he uses this, he says, the Macedonian churches, he says, they beg to be able to help. That's incredible. I don't know when, the, when you last begged to give. <laughs> But that was the nature of these people. It was like the, the woman who, who had given him everything. There was an expression of her heart. It was an act of worship. It was a way of honoring God. And so she gets that honor because of everyone who put in, Jesus honors her. And so Paul does exactly the same thing. He honors the people who don't have as much, but yet their heart is what demonstrates bigness and largeness. And it's their heart that demonstrates the giving nature that we as believers should have. And so when I look at this, um, he talks and he speaks here specifically about, uh, about looking for an opportunity to give. Um, and then he talks about a stingy planter. Talks about sowing and reaping. And then he describes the way we should sow and the way that we should reap. And so I'm going to read from Eugene Peterson's uh, description of this particular text. And it starts off by this. It says, um, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and to make up your own mind what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything more than just ready to do what needs to be done. As one psalmist puts it, he throws caution to the winds, giving to the needy in reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out, never wear out. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something you, that you can give away and then give away, which grows into fully formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. I mean, that's the point. 
we are seeing a generous God in action. We're seeing a generous God speaking into the context of giving, speaking in the context of generosity. And he's simply saying, you know what? I'm going to surprise you. That's what he says. I'm going to astonish you with blessing. How many of you right now would like to be astonished with blessing? I would. I'd love to. And so he talks about the farmer and he talks about sowing and he talks about reaping. And so I don't know of any farmers in our community, but I certainly know that many people know farmers. And so let's just have a look at this. When you sow, it's what you sow is what you get. And so for me, there are three things that we want to talk about is whether I sow determines on a crop. It's what I sow and it's how I sow. That's kind of just three things that maybe we can just quickly talk about and put it into this cloud on Father's Day. And so dads, this is good for you because I do feel that as fathers, we need to be setting the tone and setting people free by our own example. And so here we go. The harvest depends on whether you sow. There's no farmer who can expect a harvest who is not willing to sow a seed. All right, well, people say, yeah, you know, I've got needs and so it's a little difficult for me right now to sow. Well, I have a need, I have a need, I've got a need to pay my bond, I've got a need to pay the repayments of my car, I've got a need to pay this, I've got a need to pay this, and of course I've got groceries to buy, I need, I need, I need. And actually what we need to know is the following, that any farmer who is serious about need is serious about seed. So I'll say that again. All right, a farmer is not serious about need, if he's not serious about need, that he cannot be serious about seed. And so we've got to look at it. I mean, that's just a simple thing. It's not just a nice little line that rhymes. It's simply saying this, actually, I do have needs. And so therefore, I need to be serious about seed. And so for me to experience a harvest in this drought climate that we're in, in terms of just the financial uh, strain on everyone and the, you know, the kind of world recession that's happening, well, then I certainly need to be looking at where have I got seed and if I can find seed, well, then I need to be sowing it. And what does seed look like at a time such as this? So Nadine and I sat down and, and we kind of looked at things and, you know, like everyone else, we were kind of doing the sums and, and just deciding, well, actually, you know what, this is a time where we need to be sowing more than we've ever sown before. Okay. And uh, we, we kind of thought, well, what do we do? And so this is what Nadine said. She said, you know, I'm sitting with hundreds of CDs. Who listens to a CD today? Everything has, is on iTunes or it's all electronic. It's all digital. And so we kind of thought to ourselves, well, all right, who's going to have these CDs? So what we did is we thought, that is seed. We can't give the CD to someone because generally, certainly in our culture, the people don't listen to them. But what we can do is we can go to cash converters and we can convert these things. And, you know, by doing it, we actually walk in a way with seed to sow. I mean, that's just a practical example. And so now we're on this kind of binge in terms of, well, let's see, where's more seed to sow here? We can give stuff away. That's sowing as well. And so there's plenty. I've just kind of looked at my cupboard and I thought, geez, I, I don't know where I lost all that. I mean, oh my goodness, what about that thing? It's been hiding away. It's probably gathered some dust as well. And so we just realized, you know what? In the northern suburbs, folk, we can hoard. We really can. And I've often said it by an absolute confession that I walk into my house, I'm carrying something. I walk out of my house, I'm carrying nothing. So what happened to that something that I brought in? Well, it's still there. And so now we've realized, actually, we've got to start turning that into seed. We've got to give things away. We've got to kind of just cash converters. Yeah, we come again, but we're going to sell it. So we've got more seed to sow because this stuff is just sitting there. And if anything, it's kind of losing its relevance. You know, I know that fashions do return, but we're not prepared to wait that long. And so if I look at this, I do think it's a brilliant thing here. You know, if I have a need, <laughs> I better make sure I've got seed because my need actually is so dependent on the seed that I sow. No farmer will just stop in his tracks and say, oh, hold on a minute, I'm going to eat my seed. Because if I look at how things are looking, it's looking bad. You know, I don't want to go and risk it. I don't want to go and plant seed and then suddenly discover that actually I've, got, I've done myself great harm. Well, you would look at the farmer and just think, no, no, that's what farmers do. When times are tough, irrespective of what the climate looks like, they sow because they know that actually when they sow, they get the return. And so that's interesting, isn't it? So harvest depends on, on what I sow as well. And so I think this really comes down to, to, um, <clears throat> to you know, what, what am I sowing? If I'm sowing tomato seeds, don't expect to get apple seeds. If I'm sowing watermelons, don't expect to get pears. You know, so there is something about the dynamic of what it is that we're sowing. If I, if I want friends, then I need to be available in myself to be a friend. 
You know, if I feel like I'm, on, I'm not on the receiving end of, of love, then I've got to sow love to get love. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, if you sow to the flesh every day of the week, don't expect that you're going to harvest to the Spirit on a Sunday. It just doesn't work that way. All right, and so for me it's about, wow, the sowing and reaping thing is so real. And then you look at what farmers do. A farmer puts his seed in the ground and then he trusts. What does he trust? He trusts nature. He trusts the heavens to open over his seed. He trusts the sun to shine over his seed. He trusts the climate to be what it should be so that he can have a harvest. I think that farmers have greater trust in nature than us as believers have a trust in the God who created nature. Really. And so we sowing seeds. <laughs> Let me tell you, we took our CDs. We got a couple of bucks for it. But that seed that we're going to sow, all right? We're going to sow. We're going to trust our Father who has told us to do this. Putting ourselves into that context. Putting ourselves into a place where the decision is, this is a season where we can sow more than we've ever sown before. And it's not so much to get back, because I'm going to cover that in a moment, but certainly it is in a place. You know, Paul, when he wrote to the church in Philippi, he says this. He says, I'm wanting to see that you will realize the goodness of God in response to your giving. That's what he says. You go and read it. Philippians 4, 13, right through to verse 19. Interesting and wonderful text. And so we have to put God to the test and we have to trust him. Now, here's another thing that I do want to preach about. But uh, I realize at the moment I go into this context people start to see that, well, this is a truth that we do find particularly inconvenient, inconvenient. And I want to say, well, I'm going to read it now, because one day when you get to heaven, and I haven't done this, you can turn around and say, Jesus, you know, you never taught us this. Life would have been a whole lot better if Ash had have opened his mouth and preached what was in your word. And so I'm just kind of thinking, I'm doing this because I know that the scriptures work. I know that we can trust God. But this is what happens in Malachi. Malachi says this, about how we should be giving. This is actually the starting point. Firstly, I think the starting point is where my heart is at. But the starting point is how can I honor God with my giving? Is it a sacrifice right now? There's too much month at the end of my money. So therefore, clearly it is a sacrifice. So how do we, how do we, how do we, how do, we do this? And God says, all right, I'll help you. He says, I know that this is tough. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in my scriptures. I'm going to put in my law. I'm going to, it's not law. This is the word of God. Okay, the tithing is way before the law. Way before the law. And so what we're looking at here is he says, all right, firstly, will a man rob God? And our response to that is, no, 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 God, we don't ever want to rob you. No. He says, but you have. Really? How have we robbed you? He says, well, with the tithe. You haven't paid your tithes. Tithes is the first fruit. Tithes is the first amount that you get. And you, you simply, it says, you, you've got to bring it to the storehouse. So your storehouse is the place where you get spiritual benefit. The storehouse is a place that you say, I'm a son and daughter in that house. You can't go to Wimpy, enjoy the meal at Wimpy, and then say, listen, you know, coronavirus lockdown hasn't helped the Nandos across the road there, um, and they've been struggling. So thanks very much for the lovely meal, but I'm just going to go and pay at Nandos. It doesn't work like that. All right, it's got to work around the context of, this is the storehouse. This is the place that God has raised up in the city, like many other churches, but you're not part of those other churches. That's not your family. That's not where the leadership pray for you. This is the church where it happens. And so just to help people actually get a better understanding of what a local congregation is, the local church is what makes up the whole city, but there are many congregations in the city. And so here we are sitting as a congregation called New Covenant Church, Bryanston. And so here we look at this text. It says, you have robbed me. I just I look at that. My logic says, gee, God, well, I don't want to rob you. And yet, what if, hypothetically, what if I decide, hey, God, this is tough, you know. Um, and I go out and I spend my tithe, the amount that should be my tithe, on clothes, on a house, on a car, on all of these other things that, you basically need in life. The clothes that I wear, if I've robbed from God, then it means what I've taken from Him actually is stolen. And what I go and buy with the stolen money means that I'm actually wearing stolen clothes. I'm living in a stolen house. I'm driving a stolen car. I'm eating stolen food. My logic. And I just think, oh, hold on a minute. Actually, I don't know that I'm the only person. 
I actually think that maybe there's a general thought out there. Well, times are tough, so let's do it our way when God says, no, 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 there's a blessing when you do it my way. And this is the blessing. It's, descri it's described for us here in about verse, verse 13 where it simply says the following. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for you. We've got to stop trying to do the for you part because God's already said, I will do that for you. But we seem to think that we can take care of the for you when actually God's saying, no, 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 I'll take care of the for you because in actual fact, you can't take of the for, for you. I hope I haven't got you all confused there. But he says, I'll rebuke the devourer for you. And the blessing of God is that he will simply open up the windows of heaven and we will contain a blessing that just is overwhelming. A blessing enough for us to be able to share. And so I look at this and I just think, here we are on Father's Day. I mean, what a message to teach because dads, you've got to be generous at a time like this. You've got to begin to lead in the area that we're in at the moment. I know this truth is strong, but it's strong because it's inconvenient in a time such as this. But if it's truth and the truth's going to set us financially free, then I'm going to encourage that you and I step into this and we begin to see what it is. We need to gather our seed. And so if the seed's not coming through your paycheck, I'm pretty sure the seed's sitting right around you and it's time for you to turn that seed into something so that you can benefit others and just watch what happens. So giving for Nadine and I, it's really an opportunity to give in line with God's own heart, to give in line with God's own heart for resourcing kingdom work. We're part of a church. We have been part of the church, other churches as well. And that has always been our attitude in terms of tithes and offerings. Is there we want to give because it's an opportunity to give in line with God's own heart for resourcing kingdom work. We've never given so that we could say, look at us. I don't even know what goes into the church account. I don't know who pays tithes. I could ask. But actually, it's got nothing to do with me. It's between you and God. We give so that we can say, look at what God's doing through this incredible ministry that God has put into this city. This city needs this community. This city needs this church, especially at a time like this. And so for us, when we begin to see this church advance and we've watched it over the last 19 years and before us, the, the previous 20 years, we, we've just seen God advance initiatives through this particular congregation. And so when we give, we're lining up our hearts, which was God's desire for this city years ago. Can I say in eternity, God knew that this church would exist and what a wonderful opportunity it is for us to share. So God, I feel, wants to prompt generosity in our hearts this morning. God wants to just simply remind us that actually He is a loving Father. And, you know, when He was teaching His disciples, He said, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, which is what we should be praying. But I tell you, this is a time for us to sow. This is a time for us just to gather our hearts together. Husbands and wives, I'm going to encourage you just to join together. Even if you wanted to, why don't you include your family and simply say, you know what? This is the climate. This is where we're at. So now's the time for us to begin to trust our God. And He's encouraged you to trust Him. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to ask the musicians to come and we're going to go out with a wonderful, wonderful song describing His goodness as a great God. And so as I conclude right now, I'm going to pray for you. All right, Father, I pray for this incredible church. Thank you for your word that has actually come into our hearts. And it really, it's not just to scare us, but it's to encourage us. Father, you're not that kind of God. You're a God who loves us. You're a God who, who looks to see how we can be a people in a better place. And so, Father, to that end, we trust you for your goodness and your kindness to us at this time. But together, let's worship. Thank you, musicians.
so hart man fällt father's house that's a wonderful wonderful line in that song check your shame at the door because you're in the father's house maybe you're sitting this morning as a dad specific to dads and you're thinking to yourself you know what my life is not right with God well this is an opportunity for you to come to your father and to simply ask him to accept you and he will he wants you to become a child of his and so this is an opportunity for you to pray this prayer because this is a prayer that will take you into that space that you so long for, to be in your Father's house. And this is the prayer. I want you to simply pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry that I've sinned and I ask you to forgive me. I accept what you did for me on the cross. You shed your blood so that I might be saved. And today, as a dad, as a father, 
I'm coming out of darkness. I'm coming into life. I'm coming to that place of being born again by the Spirit of God so that I can be the dad you want me to be. But you are my father. And to that end, I thank you. If you pray that prayer, I want to say welcome and congratulations. That's incredible. We really celebrate. The angels in heaven are celebrating. And uh, can I say this? This is, this is, these are always helpful moments, all right? Now that you've prayed, and I know that you were serious, then I want you to tell someone. Tell someone that you prayed a prayer at the weekend of Jesus Christ coming into your life. Tell people that you're a believer. Because the scripture says when you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his angels in heaven. And let me tell you, it's better, it's better felt than it is spoken. You might not have the words, but you will just know after having described your experience that, hey, hold on a minute. I'm actually born again. Things are different. Things have changed. So God bless you. Dads, I want to I just pray blessing over you this morning as well. Father, I pray blessing over dads, over fathers, grandfathers. Thank you for them. Thank you that you put in place the family. And God, to that end, we want to hold up the family before you and the dads who lead those families that they might at this time be dads who are victory dads, dads who are loving dads, dads who translate into loving husbands as well, dads who just are, are friends, dads who love Jesus. And so to that end, Father, we just ask, would you bless them? Would you bless them in Jesus' name? I'm going to ask the family members around about the dads and the granddads. Hey, you know what? Give them a good hug. Make them a cup of coffee. Let them know the love. Share the love. Let them just feel that uh, they're important and they're special. God bless you all. It's been wonderful to connect. And next week, we uh, have uh, Joe Nimant. Uh, he's going to be leading the worship or he's going to be doing worship. It won't be in this type of format. It'll be in a very different type of format. And uh, we're going to speak specifically about what it means to be a kingdom disciple. If you're a little concerned about what's going on in the world right now, coronavirus plus all the racial activity, uh, then you need to dial in to next Sunday because I'm going to speak specifically into that context and bring a kingdom perspective. So, hey, invite your friends. Uh, let's make sure that we're living godly lives and doing what it is that we're supposed to do. Bless you. Thank you so much for watching with us. We trust that you enjoyed the message. And for more content, please have a look at our YouTube page as well as our website. Awesome. Cheers. Cheers.